tackle with re-territorialization, earth reparation, constructed natures, and the architecture of carbon sequestration. Yes. And a welcome to Filippo. Because I have a lot of slides actually, so we can read. Okay, okay. I'll manage. That's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, glad to be here. Um, I'm an Italian architect who works in the Netherlands almost for five years now. Uh, I will present you a project that we did uh, together with uh, <coughs> Tania Bakin at the Department of Urbanism and Landscape Architecture at the Delft University of Technology. Can you speak? Well, the project is an attempt to um, reconceptualize the notion of infrastructure in, in that, are, that will be responsive to the crisis that we're facing at the moment. But without further ado, I will um, go and delve into the project. Uh, the, actually, the project is about, um, well, it's made on two um, different steps. So the first is a bit theoretical, uh, with some essays that we wrote um, on it. And the second one, it's about the project. So we use a method called research by design. So we actually use design as a way of doing research. Um, Late-stage capitalism, with the rise of neoliberal policies and the financialization of the economy, is exacerbating the sign of a system that creates the need for increasing cycles of extraction and production in contrast with the actual carrying and regenerative capacity of Earth systems. The question of carbon is key in order to regain a deeper relationship with the planet. If we have to respect the Paris Agreement of two degree level, we should not burn more than 565 gigatons of carbon, while there is reserve for more than 2,795 gigatons of carbon. Not only the shift to new energy system is crucial, but also the compensation and mitigation of carbon that is already in the atmosphere is ever more important. At the time of cheap nature, to use the words of Jason Moore, fossil fuels, linear mod models of extraction, coupled with unprecedented levels of atmospheric carbon, a new project of imagination must emerge to overcome the dualities of nature culture, economy ecology, urban and rural domain. As seemingly unrelated fields, ground and atmosphere hold an inseparable bond, the carbon cycle. Largely overlooked, the capacity of the ground to produce and sustain cycles of decomposition, recycling of organic matter, growth of plants, and carbon sequestration is here explored by design in order to unravel possible future urban landscape transformation that could contribute to the ambitious project of earth reparation. Um, because, uh, well, actually, working at the Department of Urbanism, we are actually very interested in the question of urbanization. Um, so to think, uh, to have an ecological lens of the question of urbanization, it's to think about the relations so that the urban has with the rest of the world. So if we have to have an ecological lens on the question of urbanization, our focus should immediately shift toward the altered and supportive spaces of processes that are related to urbanization. So we started to be very much interested in this notion of the ground, and uh, we actually um, made a visual, uh, well, historical analysis, but also visual analysis on how the notion of the ground and also how visually the ground has changed throughout history. And we found three major, let's say, paradigm shifts um, in relation to the notion of the ground. Um, well, the ground has always been a kind of a supporting element or infrastructure, if you can say it, um, to um, the first processes of urbanization 
um, or civilization. So the capacity to divert water, to create fertile ground, made actually it's on the Fertile Crescent, is actually the process that made civilization start. But actually, if we see also a map of the Roman Empire, you see here on the left, or on your, yes, on your left, uh, actually you can see a map of the Roman Empire, but actually the whole North Africa was a granary to actually feed the empire. So the, the, actually the, the changing of spaces, or the so-called extended urbanization, to use the, 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 the word of Neil Brenner, which refers to Andy Lefebvre theory, um, is actually very important. Uh, a major um, actually shift in the notion of the ground came in with Western colonialism at the beginning of the 15th century, in which actually the ground shifted from being something that is, was produced as something more as a commodity. So ground um, started to be related with the question of dispossession, of material trade, and capital, accumula uh, and capital accumulation. This is a map of the, let's say, extended network of empires of British, Dutch, and Spanish trade routes. Um, the prosperous Dutch Golden Age was largely fostered by wealth reaped from overseas trading and colonial venture. Exotic luxuries from all over the world poured into Dutch ports. Fruits from across the Mediterranean, tobacco from the New World, spices, precious gems from India, tea, silk and porcelain from China and Japan, sugar from colonies in Brazil and Guyana. Dutch artists started to incorporate these highly valued imports into their paintings. The genre evolved from smaller and modest composition, spotlighting locally available goods early in the center to larger, more sumptuous areas of predominantly foreign commodities or grounds. Uh, actually, this laid the basis to what, in the, as a kind of product of the Enlightenment, in which the very distinction between the natural and the social world is exactly a product of it. Uh, which produced and required the othering of nature to search for the practical, practical and useful knowledge as the power to control nature. Actually, this paradigm shift then laid the basis to what is the, was the Industrial Revolution as the capacity of human societies to dig deeper in the ground and to consume resources, resources at a, a faster rate. And in this period, actually, the so-called Great Acceleration started. Um, another paradigm shift in relation to the ground actually starts with the, actually the chemical revolution and with the advent of more advanced technological systems starting from the first industrial revolution, soil and natural resources have been depleted constantly. For example, the hunger for industrial fertilizers, nitrogen, potassium came with a shift to larger productive units, economies of scales, and the homogenization of large patches of green areas which have lost biodiversity, carbon absorption capacity and water retention mechanisms. Uh, so everything we made also with, the, with this analysis, we, we tried to portray it in a drawing uh, in order to appropriate the knowledge that we were producing. Here you see a drawing in which uh, the red line it's between, it's, um, separates the regenerative practices on the left and the extractivist practices on the right. And this is a, it's a very much a paradigm shift in terms of how actually biology was the main principle which was working with cycles of nature and then in how chemistry actually changed the, the, the whole game. We, we did it with, for the land, but we also did it for, for water. So not just how we manage the land, but also how we manage the water, uh, water spaces. So it's, if the ultimate form of culture is the relationship we have with the land or the ground, then our industrial society is a culture of exclusion, separation from nature or ourselves. And we live in a highly mediated urban industrial world where we have lost the visual and cultural relations to the surfaces and subsurfaces of production, where materials and things come from. Within this paradigm, the atmosphere holds the byproducts of industrial societies. In this regard, it could be um, seen as the largest waste dumping site or landfill of the earth where the byproducts of industrial transformation eventually deposit. So within this paradigm, uh, here it starts the, the project, the Research by Design project, which wants to be a kind of project of imagination. Um, so uh, in the design challenge of the 21st century, that is the transition to a low carbon economy, different systems will have to be redesigned. There seems to be a lack of imagination when we are confronted with the magnitude and the scales of the issue. 
In this sense, the project wants to show that change is possible and that pathways that involve cultivation, reforestation, and carbon sequestration becomes one of the most essential infrastructural strategy for earth preparation. And it is now well known that um, there is got, uh, greater and growing consensus, consensus that compared to investments required to transition to 100% renewable energy, a land use approach, plantation, cultivation, reforestation, might actually be the fastest, cheapest, and practical way to dial down carbon emission. Um, so, actually the project is situated in the, in the Randstad. The Randstad is a kind of region of the Netherlands which involves, um, Rand means ring and Stad means city, so the ring of cities between Amsterdam, Utrecht, The Hague, and Rotterdam. Uh, the Dutch have been very good in planning their um, territory because of uh, water problems. And so this is a kind of region that works as a metropolis with four cities uh, that are actually interdependent to one another. And so the circle is a diameter of 150 kilometers because I wanted, we wanted to show that the real actually scale to plan in order to have an ecological approach is not the scale of the city, but it should be the scale of the region, regardless, let's say, of the administrative boundaries. And this comes from the theories of Richard Foreman, which was the father of ecological planning at Harvard starting from the, from the late 80s. So then we started to have some research questions. So what would it take in the Randstad to draw down carbon? Uh, we wanted to show that productive land users can shift from being carbon source to ones that act as carbon sinks. And it resembles cultivation rather than extraction. That work with different cycles of nature in order to harvest its potential rather than exploit and deplete it. So we're looking for ground transformation or strategies that would be able to construct new land use hybrids. So this is the Netherlands, it's about 41,000 square kilometers, 33,000 square kilometers of land, 7,000 of, of, of water. The urban region that I took into consideration is about 5,000 square kilometers. And basically the project just want to show that, um, well, we should have a different approach to land use. And of course, um, I'll rush a bit. Um, then we needed to find the space in which actually plantation and cultivation could have been possible. So we divided the 5,000 square kilometers of the urban region by its open space ratio, which is basically the percentage of open space, and we found the, these 3,000 square kilometers. With the help of geographic information system, we divided between uh, all the different layers or all the different land uses that we found in the, in the, in the territory. So here it's, uh, let's say, the, all the layers of the territory, which include op open spaces and built spaces. And then we said, okay, let's just take it singularly and let's see what is possible. So this is a map of the Netherlands with the, past, with the pasture land use. Of course, we all know um, how dysfunctional is past, pasture at the moment with the production of ammonia and the fertilizers, completely unsustainable. Um, and so what we did is that we, okay, we said, okay, we have pasture and the pasture will be there, but can we find uh, land uses or transformative strategy from a landscape architecture point of view that, that could go in symbiosis with the current land use and that could, they could have mutual benefits. So we applied in a section on the left, you see how it's pasture nowadays, and then we applied what we said, gradients of transformation in which different densities of eco new ecologies would be uh, grafted into the territory. And then we had some performance parameters and we started to actually quantify the, the let's say the carbon sequestration potential of each layer. We did it for pasture, but we did it also for arable land and for a whole set of layers, also for open water. The open water, it's, it's well, the relation that we, that we have is with open water is really um, dysfunctional also here because we have been fishing up into the food chain while we should actually um, shift towards some primary production, uh, which harvests actually this, uh, solar energy in a much more efficient way. So there's a transformation here, for example, to shellfish farming or to seaweed production. Um, and we did it also for all the other, all the other layers. So with the continuous urban development, continuous urban development is basically very dense areas, which 80% are with sealed surfaces. That means, for example, asphalt, 80% of asphalt, and 20% it's grass in which you can actually plant and have new performances of um, uh, ecological performances. And we did it for all the layers that I want to go. Um, 
we, we actually wanted to not just to visualize um, the, the whole project, but we wanted to quantify it. So actually we found that just with one-fourth of the land of the Netherlands, if we would uh, apply um, this project at uh, its full potential and we found some performance parameters uh, by the, with the book, the project drawdown, uh, we actually uh, quantified that 30 megaton of carbon could be sequestered into the land by building new and healthy soil. So the Netherlands, just with one fourth of its territory, could reach 65% of the Paris Agreement uh, at, um, <coughs> 20, at, uh, until 2030 with 30 megaton of carbon. And of course, it's not just the carbon sequestration, but there is a whole lot of co-benefits uh, associated with it, related to water retention mechanism and biodiversity and uh, other species that will thrive in this type of environment. This is the, one of the last slides. <coughs> we wanted to, um, I hope you know um, Edward Eugene Odum, which was the father of, let's say, modern ecology from, uh, from, from biology. Um, and we wanted to um, actually uh, quantify our model or our uh, project with this <coughs> diagram on open system. So the quantification of the temporal dimension defines the amount of performance as ecologies of scales and also potential market creation as economies of, uh, in time. Um, last thing that I want to show is that um, actually the cultivation of land requires also and the cycles of harvesting with this new, uh, with new vegetation requires and will actually um, um, make new jobs available, new jobs related to the transformation of material. Because actually, if we look at it, everything comes from, from the land and, uh, and from the ground. And well, the whole sector, for example, of the bee economy is uh, one, of the, one of the examples. So I don't know if dirt or the ground can save the earth, but at least I think it can make a very relevant contribution. Thank you.